Hi, everybody. Welcome to Euromax Highlights. Today, we're looking back at the best of what this past week had to offer. Here's what's coming up. Nativity Play, exploring the origins of a Christian tradition. Seeing double, why a Polish house comes with two roofs. And Sweet Sensation, a meringue treat from France, is an international hit. Let's start off by tracing back the origins of a Christmas tradition, the nativity play. The pageant is performed in churches and schools every year, but where did it all start? It was in Italy that Mary and Joseph's journey was first reenacted on stage in a small hill town called Greccio, about 90 kilometers north of Rome. Back in the early 13th century, St. Francis of Assisi had the idea to perform the nativity scene with real actors. Well, that tradition lives on there to this day, and during Advent, visitors from far and wide travel to the Sabina Hills to see where it all began. A nativity play performed in Italy's Sabina Hills near the village of Greccio. This is where St. Francis of Assisi created the very first nativity play back in the 13th century. I want to create a new Bethlehem here. Federico Giovanelli hails from Greccio. Every year he stars as Francis of Assisi in the play. This is a very old tradition that dates back to 1223 when Francis of Assisi returned from Palestine. He hiked through this region, which reminded him a lot of the Holy Land. So he stayed here and asked his friend, the Greccio nobleman Giovanni Velita, to stage a nativity play. St. Francis's legacy is still omnipresent in the medieval village of Greccio. Nearby, a mighty Franciscan monastery sits atop a Monte Lacerone cliff ledge. Many visitors come here to see the grotto where Francis staged the first ever nativity play in 1223 to bring the story of Christmas closer to the people. He wanted to portray the birth of Jesus Christ for everyone to see with their very own eyes so they can better grasp and appreciate it. The grotto features a 14th century fresco depicting Mary, the baby Jesus, and a kneeling and praying Francis. Thirty-four years ago, new life was breathed into this nativity play tradition. Now, every year, starting on December 24th, the nativity play is performed in front of an international audience. The Greccio Nativity Play is organized by enthusiastic locals. It's become a tradition since 1973. They volunteer. They're not paid to do this. Greccio has also opened a unique nativity museum featuring exhibits from Italy and other countries. This nativity scene, for example, comes from Botswana in Africa. These are all wonderful, but I like the Alaskan exhibit best. The birth of Jesus Christ represents the family. We can all relate to this aspect of the Christian faith. It's one of Italy's most important religious traditions. Many market stalls in Greccio also offer small nativity scenes. Some pretty unconventional options are available. This is shaped like a swan and is made from a pumpkin. 
It was hollowed out and worked on for two years. It contains figurines made from cloth. For the locals, the nativity scene is an important aspect of Christmas. But the highlight each Christmas remains the actual play, of course. It's performed between December 24th and January 6th and gets visitors from all over the world into the Christmas spirit. Now it's time to visit a toy factory in Ukraine which takes us back to a simpler time when toys were made of wood. Ugears is a startup company that has taken the world by storm. Four years ago, they began crowdfunding their business and now they're selling their products in over 80 countries. In fact, their success caught the attention of Disney and the two companies are now collaborating on a joint venture. So let's take a look at these incredibly intricate contraptions that make the perfect Christmas present. Each of these models comprises hundreds of individual parts. You won't find any plastic, glue or batteries here. The trains and trucks consist exclusively of intricately assembled pieces of wood. Motors propelled forwards by rubber bands. And there aren't just vehicles to choose from either. No one expected us to create a musical instrument you can assemble and play yourself. Like the old masters, our customers can build an instrument from the Middle Ages. The Ugears company was founded in Kiev in 2014 and has been exporting toys to fans the world over ever since. To be successful with wooden models in the plastic age, every angle must be right, every detail must be exact. It often takes dozens of attempts until everything is perfect. Engineers work hard to achieve this. What attracts them to it? It's always interesting to come up with your own ideas and then turn them into reality. After the design has been finalized, they use a laser to cut the pieces from thin plywood. Customers can press them out of the sheets at home and assemble them according to a blueprint. Some 30 models are now available, with something for everyone, from beginners to professional craftsmen. But sometimes customers have special requests too. In Southeast Asia, our partners asked us to put something other than a ballerina in the middle of the model. That could symbolize happiness, for example. The ballerina isn't popular there. It's always about giving our customers things that mean something to them. Then they sell better. Assembly of the tractor model with 97 parts takes just three quarters of an hour to complete. At least for an experienced model maker. The most complex models consist of almost 600 parts. Analog puzzles seem to be catching on again in the digital world. Production is currently running full speed ahead. The models still being packaged here will end up all over the world in time for Christmas. The models are designed and manufactured here in the Ukrainian capital, Kiev. But less than a tenth of production remains in the country. Overseas customers have long since discovered the former startup. Facebook and Instagram spread the word even without expensive advertising. Ugears sells its models in around 80 countries, and even big companies are interested in a cooperation. But what comes next? The goal is not to build bigger and bigger models or become even more complex. There are already clear limits, after which it would be so difficult that most people couldn't assemble them anymore. We're more concerned with aesthetics and originality. Like this innovative wooden safe. Incidentally, 
Ugiz stands for Ukrainian Gears, a name that aptly describes the heart of these modern-day mechanical toys. We're staying with design now, but on a much bigger scale. When Polish architect Toba Konieczny decided to develop his own home on a mountain slope, it was clear that it would have to be something special. He calls his prize-winning project The Ark, and I'm sure you'll understand why when you see our next report. The impressive structure looks like it could be steered away at any moment, but Konieczny is quite content staying there with his family. We headed to a wintry Brenner to take a closer look. Set in the spectacular landscape of the Beskidi Mountains, the silhouette of a house there makes it immediately clear. It was designed by an architect who likes to experiment. The building has two roofs, one at the top and one reaching down to the ground. The facade is very minimalist. Architect Robert Konieczny's house is considered one of the most modern residential projects in Poland. Welcome to my ark. It's very foggy today. Very little furniture, soft colors and straight lines ensure a peaceful ambience. Huge windows dominate the room. An elegant and ingenious fireplace offers warmth and coziness. For Robert Konieczny, design isn't the essential feature here. Interior design should be simple and calm and not distract from what's happening outside the house. We have a very nice view from this side and from the other side, and it changes every day. Even the fog today is magical, as if we were in heaven. The main entrance is opened by remote control so that you reach the house, the architect's ark, as if via a jetty. It looks as if it's just making a brief stop on the mountain slope. The wall on one side of the house can be moved as necessary to make best use of the natural light in the living room. If I were to build a garden or a terrace here, or put up a fence, let alone plant something, it would look strange and totally inappropriate. With my idea, you get the feeling that you own the whole mountain. The house is floating on the mountain. There are no borders here. The building has about 140 square meters of living space and was designed in such a way as to allow the water coming from the mountains to flow off naturally underneath it. There is no foundation. The house stands on three pillars. These are hidden from view by a screen that looks like a second roof, which creates the arc-like form. After the architect moved in, the word ark took on a second meaning for him. Animals don't mind this house. In summer they come and sleep near it. But now in winter they stay in the forest. Ecological aspects also played an important role in planning the house. For example, Konieczny sprayed the inside walls with a protective foam that gives a special look to the bathroom and the walls can store heat better, a both minimalist and very functional design. My house should be in symbiosis with nature and not fight it with technology. The architecture and design magazine Wallpaper has named Robert Konieczny's Ark the best private home of 2017. The Polish architect had no intention of winning prizes with the house he was just looking for a place of refuge from hectic city life and created it here. Interior design at its best. Check out our YouTube channel, DW Interior Design. Stunning design ideas, spectacular buildings, and DIY tutorials on home decoration. We'll take you inside the most beautiful European homes, show you the latest in furniture, fabrics, and accessories. Subscribe and don't miss out. See you on YouTube. Now to a sweet treat that has experienced a major revival. The Merveilleux combines meringue, cream, and assorted coatings. 
Sounds delicious, but it was long viewed as old-fashioned and provincial. But one Frédéric Vaucamp thought the small snack had a bigger role to play and gave it a new recipe for success. His shops selling the delicacy have branches all over the world and the marvellous Merveilleux is proving to be a hit. We paid him a visit in Lille to get a taste. A little meringue, a little chocolate and lots and lots of whipped cream. It's pretty rich, but that didn't stop this delicacy with roots in northern France and Belgium from conquering the world. French chef Frédéric Vaucan is the man who made it famous abroad. There are several things that set this cake apart. First of all, it's very, very light. Why? Because the meringue is very airy. And because I've changed a key component. For 30 years, merveilleux were made with buttercream. I use whipped cream, a very light whipped cream. So the meringue is light, the cream is light, and the result is a pastry that looks impressive but weighs less than 100 grams. Vaucan's home base is the northern French city of Lille. The city centre was renowned for its splendid Baroque architecture until the rise of Merveilleux. It has become a veritable city trademark. It's so popular that customers queue up in long lines on Saturdays just to buy some. Customers can watch Merveilleux being made inside the shop. That's important to Vaucan, who says anyone can make them. He's even happy to share his recipes. So, let's take a look. The egg whites and sugar are whipped together to make the meringue. These meringue spirals are baked slowly in the oven for about an hour at 100 degrees Celsius. Meanwhile, the cream is whipped and as much chocolate added as desired. Finally, cream is filled between two baked meringues and the whole thing is rolled in chopped nuts or shaved chocolate. And voila, the merveilleux are ready. Frédéric Faucon offers a key tip. The most important thing is the amount of cream you use between the two meringues. It needs to have enough to make the meringue melt ever so slightly, but not too much. If you use too much, the meringue will disintegrate. The art is striking the right balance. At Au Merveilleux de Fred, there's one to please every palate. The classic version is covered in dark chocolate. Vaucan's recipe for success, however, came when he refined the traditional formula to create his own repertoire with new flavors, like cherry, pistachio, or nut. Vaucan's personal favorite is coated with crystallized meringue, a history buff, he named it after the supporters of the French Revolution, the Saint-Culotte. Customers adore his merveilleux. I actually don't like cream cakes, but these are extra light. The meringue is delicate but maintains its shape, and I love the flavors. My favorites are white chocolate and speculus. They're delicious. I love them. <laughs> <laughs> Merveilleux are finding followers the world over. Vaucan now has 20 shops, including in London, Brussels, Paris, Geneva, New York, and in Berlin. Vaucan is relaxed about his meringue's burgeoning popularity. When he's not en route to New York or opening a new branch, he's most happy working in his old shop in downtown Lille. I just love my product. That's why I like to be here. Unfortunately, or possibly luckily, I'm on the road a lot. Then I miss being in my store. Whenever I have the time, I'm here. I need this. Somehow, I find it reassuring to bake my own cakes. But Frédéric Vaucan doesn't have long to linger. He's scouting for new locations in Amsterdam and Dusseldorf. After 36 years, he's still happy to share his passion for Merveilleux. Want to know more about European lifestyle and culture? Visit Euromax on Facebook. You'll find highlights from our programs. 360-degree videos of the most beautiful places in Europe 
and snapshots taken by our reporters. Take an exclusive look behind the scenes at how the program is produced and follow us on Facebook Live. We love it when fans visit our Facebook page and give us their feedback. Visit DW Euromax on Facebook. Well, we have time for some music and to play us out, how about a little bit of Beethoven? It's almost 250 years ago that the composer was born and his legacy is still celebrated in his hometown of Bonn to this day. The biannual Beethoven competition sees pianists from all over the world competing for 10 days. DW is the competition's media partner, so we took a closer look at the Beethoven Bonanza. An outstanding performance as Alberto Ferro plays Ludwig van Beethoven's Piano Concerto No. 4. The 21-year-old Italian wins one of the most prestigious awards for young pianists in the world, the International Telecom Beethoven Competition Bonn. I still don't believe to, to be here, just in the final and to enjoy it. Uh, it's like a dream for, for me. It's the first time that I win the, the first place in an international uh, piano competition. I always got the second and the audience award, but here it, it's giving more satisfaction. A few hours earlier, the tension was running high among the finalists. Along with Ferro, there was Ho Chong Lee from South Korea. She would end up taking third. And Japanese pianist Tomoki Kitamura, he came in second. The jury was made up of nine experts from six different countries. Alberto Ferro uh, had uh, Alberto Ferro has all the qualities needed to succeed professionally as a musician. His playing was wonderfully stable. From the first round to the last, he was in excellent form. Some of the most talented young players in the world have participated in the biannual Beethoven competition that was created in 2005. This year, there were 24 contestants from 17 countries. The competition takes place over 10 days. There are four rounds in all. The finalists play for a full house, a crowning achievement. We never can get enough of Beethoven, right? It has its own atmosphere, its own magic. Even if that sounds a little kitschy to say, it's the truth. For those who are familiar with the house here where Beethoven was born and think about the kind of situation he was in when he wrote these pieces, I think it's a special experience. It's a privilege to experience this. Ludwig von Beethoven was born in this house in Bonn in 1770. Today, it's a museum. The composer left Bonn when he was 22. But he's still ever-present in Bonn. Statues and plaques commemorate him. There's even one at the inn where he was a regular guest. The city puts on a music festival dedicated to his work every year in late summer. Nike Wagner directs the event, which partners with the piano competition. I think the public's general enthusiasm for it is very infectious. And I have to say that I think that what these youngsters accomplish is simply fantastic. Alberto Ferro takes home 30,000 euros in prize money. And that's not all. I think I will get more concerts. 
and uh, anyway, um, I just feel like um, playing, of course, more for the audience and trying to enjoy each performance. Acclaim for a young pianist in Bonn, where once the young Beethoven himself played. That's all from us for today, so thanks for watching. I'll see you again in the new year. Bye-bye for now.